What was that? Very shortly, we will begin giving you instructions. How come I have no instruments? 1,500 feet. Still 75 miles from the nearest major airport. He's out of fuel. <coughs> An airplane's engines not only provide thrust, they also generate the power needed to manipulate the plane. It would be completely uncontrollable, but modern airliners are like a Swiss army knife with one last blade hidden away. In the event of a loss of power, they automatically deploy the RAT, or Ram Air Turbine. It's spring-loaded, and the propeller that drives this small hydraulic pump is about the size of a propeller you would see like on a little Cessna 150. And this arm uh, catapults down into the slipstream, this propeller starts to turn, drives this hydraulic pump, and it gives you basic systems. Landing gear down. Roger. First officer Quintel lowers the landing gear. Because there's no hydraulic power, Quintel does what's known as a gravity drop, letting the gear's own weight drop and lock it into place. The two main gear are heavy. They fall immediately, and two green lights confirm they've locked. But the nose gear is lighter. It doesn't lock. We could hear the main gear clearly, uh, falling and locking. I was not aware that the nose gear was, was not down and locked. It was sort of a last minute. And uh, if it's something that you cannot control, you don't talk about it. You don't mention it. You know, the main thing was bring the aircraft on the runway. Five miles to touchdown. Roger. We have the field in sight. Five miles from Gimli, Pearson and Kintel finally see a runway they can land on. But there's a problem. We're too close, huh? It's going to be too steep, too fast. Yeah, I know. Pearson is almost at the runway, but he's much too high above it. If he comes down at a normal descent rate, he'll miss the landing strip. But if he comes down steeply, his plane will gather a dangerous amount of speed. He won't be able to stop before the end of the runway. <coughs> Only about 3,000 feet above the ground, the plane doesn't have enough altitude to make a full circle. It would hit the ground before making it back to the landing strip. Pearson chooses a second option. Well, I guess I'll just slip it. Pearson decides to try a maneuver called a side slip, practically unheard of on commercial airliners, but sometimes used by glider pilots. And Bob Pearson has a lot of experience flying gliders. I'm just going to slip it down till we're almost down at the runway, then I'll straighten it out. Okay. Side slipping involves what's known as crossing the controls. Here we go. Pearson plans to force the aircraft into a sideways freefall, allowing it to drop quickly without increasing its forward airspeed. Pearson has never actually performed a side slip in a glider but he's attempting one now in a Boeing 767. Crossing the controls involves tipping the wings in one direction, but turning the aircraft in the opposite direction, pushing it sideways into the oncoming air. As Flight 143 begins to drop towards the Earth, Quintel is about to discover something he did not expect. The runway he trained at 15 years ago. no longer a runway. I saw a sand trap from this golf course, and I thought, we're going to crash. Pearson must maintain a crucial balance. He's got to slow the plane enough to be able to land safely. But if he slows down too much, the airliner could lose its lift and plummet to the ground. Racing is done for the day. But the airfield is filled with members of the local sports car club. Camping out with their families for the weekend. Two children have decided to pedal the length of the runway. They don't hear the plane coming for them. Without engines, it's silent. 
And one thing the 767 doesn't have is a horn. Brace. Brace for landing. The nose hit with quite a bang on the runway. Sounded like a shotgun going off at our feet. The front landing gear gives out immediately. Pearson brakes hard. Two tires blow out. The bottom of the right engine scrapes the runway. I was a robot. There was just no emotion at all. Finally, Pearson sees what's in their path. And I looked up and I could see two boys on bicycles. They must have been probably about a thousand feet down the runway from our position when I saw them. With no nose gear to steer with, Pearson's only hope of driving the plane left or right is by varying the brake pressure on the two main landing gear. That's when my heart started to pitter-patter a little bit. The kids panic and try to outrun a plane that's traveling about 200 miles an hour. I knew I couldn't take the airplane into these boys and I was going to take it off into the grass on the right side. All he can to stop the plane in time. Holy crow! The plane plows into a guardrail installed down the middle of the runway. Smoke, Bob. There's still a lot of smoke coming from the plane's nose. Turned out it was uh, about six inches of insulation between the inner and outer skins from friction that was uh, starting to burn. The flight attendants have good news. All 61 passengers have made it off the plane. There's not so much as a single serious injury. Come on, give me a hand. Yeah, extinguisher. Bob Pearson has done what no one has done before. He's safely landed a 767 with no engines, gliding to safety for more than 26,000 feet.